If you, like our family, like to center your life around home, you probably find yourself in the kitchen a lot. There's not a lot of takeout or fast food. You need to come up with something to cook three times a day. I like to invite you into my kitchen to share with you what we're making. It isn't always fancy. A lot of times it's simple sustenance and that's exactly what I have for you this week. Simple, hearty meals that we are making for our family of 10. talk a lot on this channel about the momentum and flow of a kitchen that is really easy to maintain and to bring fresh meals and hearty healthy meals to the table really often whenever you are in that flow and that routine and how difficult it is when you aren't so this last week really demonstrates that it has been Christmas time obviously and then the week after Christmas is kind of a break for us. We don't really do a lot of work, a lot of school. Actually, we don't do school at all. It's family time, it's not very scheduled, and we're really just trying to get our bearings back. So some of the consequences of being out of the house, out of the kitchen, out of the routine and flow is meat is not thought out in the refrigerator. That's something that I make a habit to do, to always have a nine by 13 dish of various cuts of meat in the fridge, thawing out, so that way I always have something really quick to make. But whenever it's a Monday or a day after a vacation or a holiday, I am not necessarily in that pattern. So that would be the first day of this particular What Wheat in a Week video. I brought in from my garage deep freeze two roasts, two whole chickens, a couple pounds of sausage, a couple pounds or packs, I don't know if it's really a pound, of bacon, and a couple pounds of ground mousse. Since none of it is thawed yet, the first thing I'm going to make is the ground meat because it can thaw very quickly in hot water. And then also, if it's not fully thawed, I can put it in a cast iron skillet with a little bit of liquid and a lid and thaw it out very quickly. So whenever I am trying to get back in the flow of my kitchen, ground meat of any kind, whether that's pork sausage, ground beef, ground moose, ground deer, is what I will reach for. I make a lot of ground meat meals because of the very thing I just mentioned. It's very quick, even if you haven't planned ahead, you can just grab it out of the freezer and start working. But I wanted to switch it up. So I actually went on Pinterest and searched ground beef recipes. I was just hoping to find something a little different from my usual meatloaf, spaghetti, tacos. Those are the kind of things that I rely on a lot, but I found a couple of ideas for this Korean beef. Now I have mousse, so this isn't exactly Korean, but I like that the ingredients are things that I always have on hand. One is soy sauce. I use coconut aminos. I get that from Thrive Market. I always keep a lot of it on hand for things like stir fries. And then you add to that brown sugar, ground ginger, garlic. You can use fresh ginger or garlic or ground. I had fresh garlic and dried ginger. So I browned the mousse with some diced onion, poured that mixture over it, and then after that was all cooked through and nice and seasoned, I put that on top of some white rice topped it with sesame seeds, crushed pepper for me and Luke, just because that's a little bit more spicy, some green onions, and it was a really simple, easy meal that everyone absolutely loved. So I will definitely be adding that to my arsenal of ground beef recipes. No matter how much I try to prepare ahead, I still rely on those over and over again. I just got a new Instant Pot. I've been limping along without an Instant Pot for a really long time now. Mine still worked for yogurt, but it wouldn't come to pressure. And then the saute function stopped working, which I used to heat up the milk in the beginning before the yogurt function. So finally, I felt like there really wasn't any more use to my Instant Pot. So I got a new one. I got the larger size. Kind of regretting that just a tiny bit because I forgot that I already had two inserts for the smaller size as well as the glass lid that I use for yogurt. So now I have to reinvest in all of that stuff, which I'm kind of annoyed that I didn't think of that. I am making a simple roast. 
This is going to be for tacos. We have a bunch of beef roast because I get half a cow from my sister's farm. My typical way that I make roast is sear it in butter and then add in some kind of cooking liquid. Today I'm using wine. You could use beef broth, chicken broth, and I'm also doing tomatoes and then a whole bunch of spices, chili powder, cumin, garlic powder, salt, pepper, all great ones, especially for tacos. Now I'm calling this a what we eat in a week, but I'm gonna be sharing with you just some meals throughout the week because a lot of times I like to make several meals in one day and then eat off of the leftovers. So this is the same day. I'm going right into making two whole chickens. So though I made that fast thawing Korean beef yesterday with the ground mousse, overnight I thawed out two roasts and two whole chickens and I'm gonna prepare all four of those today for easier meals throughout the week. Those chickens, even though they sat in the fridge overnight, they still were just a little bit frozen, so I'm getting them in some hot water before actually putting them in the oven so that way they're fully thawed. I'll also take them out of the plastic, run some hot water inside the cavity because usually there's a little bit of ice on the inside that takes a really long time to thaw and I wanna get some food prepped for this week. We have been eating not the best throughout the holidays. We've been at a lot of parties, made lots of treats, lots of sugar and processed type of foods, and so I'm ready to you know, get into something a bit more healthier and whole, and what could be better than roasted chicken and vegetables, and beef cooked in a bunch of seasonings and spices. Uh, this will definitely work for all of that. So I'm gonna be doing a sheet pan dinner. This will be something that can cook throughout the day. We're going to have that roast for lunch and I'm gonna get this in the oven for later. I had some Brussels sprouts that were in the fridge for quite a while. They need to be cooked ASAP. Some carrots still from the garden and some beets. Ideally, you would cook these on their own in some oil with some salt, but I'm gonna just put them right under the chicken for a very easy cleanup, quick meal. Quick in that it won't take much prep, but not so much as far as the actual cook time, but that's okay. I love things that can cook in the background of my day, whether that's in an Instant Pot or a Crock Pot or just in the oven at a low temperature. It's nice knowing that things are getting more tender and delicious while also knowing that I don't really have to cook later whenever I am busy. I have never been great at the whole freezer meal thing, but I do like to prepare things in bulk for just the week ahead. I don't have to get them in the freezer, but I can use them throughout the week. And that's the thing about having a large family. You really almost can't make too much food. Now, I'm gonna spatchcock these chickens. This will just help them to cook more evenly. To do this, I'm gonna cut them down the middle underneath so I can spread them out. A lot of times whenever you're making a chicken, you run into the inside, inside like near the cavity being underdone and then the outside being overdone. This allows everything to be more exposed to the heat more evenly. There's also more exposed skin to put oil, salt, and pepper on, so you get that crispy chicken skin, which is so delicious. Whenever you just make it whole without doing the spatchcock, that's underneath, and it's usually getting um, cooked and done, but it doesn't get crisp, and so I like to do it this way on occasion. It's one little extra step that saves time in cooking and also makes everything more even. Before Christmas, I made a whole bunch of bread because we hosted on Christmas Eve Eve. Then I also wanted to bring a loaf of sourdough to the main Christmas celebration with my husband's side so that way we could eat the ham and the turkey on sourdough. I had one loaf that I never actually baked. It was still sitting in the banneton in the refrigerator and I just put it in the oven this morning. That will be really good with our chicken dinner this evening. I love serving a carb, especially when I didn't put any potatoes with the chicken. So bread and butter will be the perfect carb component. For lunch with the Instant Pot roast that I put chili powder and cumin on, really good for taco meat, we're gonna do tacos. I already had in the refrigerator from who knows when some corn tortillas. My son is shredding up some cheddar. I had a very ripe avocado in the fridge, again, from who knows when. I love it when I can look in the fridge, 
see some things we have and figure out a way to use them up before buying anything fresh and new. So yes, I did go out to the freezer and get a whole bunch of meat, but a lot of this week is just going to be using up the fresh things that we weren't able to get to because of the holidays. I've taken a quick break from my cooking to tell you about today's video sponsor, Thrive Market. Thrive Market is a membership-based online grocery store that specializes in organic and natural products. I know a lot of us in this new year are looking to swap out some things in our kitchens and pantries that are a bit healthier or maybe eat out less, cook from scratch more. Thrive Market can definitely support you in that with their offerings. Everything from pantry staples to frozen food that are quality and organic. Sometimes I have a hard time locally finding certain items that I want to stock in my kitchen, things like einkorn flour, different types of spices, organic condiments like ketchup or coconut aminos. I can find all of this on Thrive Market and for a great price. I love that on the Thrive Market website, you can sort by your dietary preference. So if you are paleo, gluten-free, dairy-free, you can make it to where you only see the things that you would want to purchase to make it a very streamlined process. I've been shopping on Thrive Market for so long that when I get on, it's really fast. I'm just looking for the things that I purchase all the time. They also do have a deals section. I like to browse through there pretty regularly just to see if something that would interest me, something new, something I wanna try, is on sale. We also do stock things like avocado oil fried chips and different little snack things for our co-op lunches or if we wanna take lunch out. Join Thrive Market today to get 30% off your first order plus a free gift worth up to $60 by using my link thrivemarket.com forward slash farmhouse on Boone. It'll also be linked in the description box below. Now, I remember earlier when I said that I had two roasts in from the outside freezer. Since I pulled out the roast from the Instant Pot and it had all of that beautiful seasoning and juices, I decided just to throw another one in. So I already have a cast iron skillet out on the stove, so I'm searing it to give it some color and lock in the juices with some butter before putting it into the juices that I already have in the Instant Pot. This is the kind of batch cooking I like doing. Something's already dirty and before cleaning it out and putting those juices in the compost or to the animals, I can just cook something that we can eat tomorrow very easily. I do also wanna point out just how beautiful bread can still be after sitting in the fridge for several days in the Banneton. Okay, this is the next day. We just ate more of that roast, more tacos. I like to top mine with that sweet chili sauce from Date Lady, more jalapenos, more cilantro. The kids like to do meat, cheese, and salsa. So I really got a lot of mileage out of all of my spice combining and out of having the Instant Pot insert dirty and the lid dirty by throwing in another roast and just eating that the next day. We are fine in our family with eating the same thing a few days in a row. We do a lot of leftovers here. 
I like having leftovers. It doesn't make for the most variety on a video like this, but with a large family, it's easier just to cook a lot whenever you have the chance, especially simple things like a meat and vegetable type of meal, which is what we rely on a lot. Now with the extra chicken from yesterday's sheet pan meal, I am going to make up one of our family's favorite things, chicken pot pie. I like to do it with sourdough biscuits. Ideally, I would have gotten those in the fridge two or three days ago just to sit there and ferment or even just yesterday. But whenever I don't, which is often, I don't think through that enough, I will just make my einkorn biscuit recipe. So if you're new here, einkorn is an ancient grain, which means that it hasn't been hybridized a lot over the years and people are able to digest it a lot more easily. A lot of the issues we have with gluten is that over the years, it has been changed and altered to have these long, stretchy strands that make the most beautiful bread. Personally, I love the way that it acts in sourdough, so I'm not mad about it. But whenever we haven't had the time to prepare the grains in a traditional way, which is souring them through something like sourdough or soaking, um, my preferred method, of course, is sourdough, it can be hard to digest. And so whenever I'm not souring something, I like to use einkorn. I keep a lot of einkorn in my pantry for situations like this. I also keep bulk whole grain einkorn that I can mill in my mill, my grain mill, but I use a lot of all-purpose einkorn as well, and that's what I'm doing with these biscuits here. The recipe is over on farmhousehomeboon.com. It's pretty simple. I mix up all-purpose einkorn flour, baking powder, sugar. I cut in butter and then add either milk or kefir or cream. I believe the official recipe over on the blog is kefir. I will just use any milk product. Now for these chicken pot pies, this recipe is also on the blog. It's a family favorite. It's a reader favorite. I follow it extremely loosely anymore. I like recipes in my kitchen that I can get comfortable with, how they go together, and then just play around with the proportions and throw them together without having to measure and read each thing. Another example of that would be like orange chicken. I've made orange chicken so much in my kitchen that I know about how much orange juice to soy sauce or coconut aminos in my case to vinegar to maple syrup ratio just by looking at it with the amount of chicken I have thought out versus having to make sure that everything's all perfect. It's the same thing with this recipe and those are the best kind in the kitchen so you don't have to constantly look back or measure. You just kind of take what you have, use it loosely. So for this, the loose version is to saute potatoes, carrots, onions, in butter. I will use other vegetables sometimes if I don't have this combination, but this is the most common that I keep in my kitchen year round. Oh, also minced garlic. Sometimes I'll add in something else. Sometimes if I don't have onions, I might double up the garlic or double up the onions if I don't have something else. I like to have potatoes and carrots in this, but I've even made it without that. Also, you'll end up adding in some frozen peas. You can also do fresh. And I like to do that at, at the end. After you cook it in the butter, add a little bit of flour and then some broth. The flour is meant to thicken up the sauce, which is made up of broth and cream. So I like to keep on my stove broth going almost all the time in the winter. I can get more than one batch out of one pot of bones by just adding more water. I like to do this in a cast iron Dutch oven because it doesn't have as much evaporation happen as a stainless steel pot with a glass lid. You wanna be careful that you do have plenty of water so it doesn't all evaporate off and you just have dry bones sitting there. But I will leave this on around the clock on the simmer, which is just one tiny flame in the middle of my burners. Keep it on the back of the stove and just use it as I need it by putting it through a fine mesh strainer. I usually use a cup measurer to dip it out and then put it through the strainer. I like to make these chicken pot pies very creamy, so I add quite a bit of cream and broth and just cook it until it's thick and creamy and then add my biscuits on top. I'm going to put these on a sheet pan or like a Texas sheet cake pan at the bottom of the oven so that 
if it spills over, which it most certainly will. I forgot to use my larger cast iron skillet. These two were just already out on the stove, and so I didn't want to take the time to get out a different one, but I'm going to be having a lot of over spilling here. That's okay. I also have an extra couple biscuits I'm just going to throw into a bread pan and cook separately because I doubled up my batch of einkorn biscuits, and so I have a few extra. I always make two chicken pot pies. Sometimes when my family is really hungry, they can eat almost all of that. A lot of times I have enough for another meal. Honestly, I really should get out all of my cast iron skillets. I have three total that are big enough to make chicken pot pies and just get all three of them going at once so that we can have something to warm up in a pinch throughout the week. I always like to make extra food. Something that I've been wanting to experiment too is with more recipes for boneless skinless chicken. I used to be pretty anti boneless skinless chicken, mostly because it is not the most budget friendly thing. It truly isn't. So if you are feeding a large family, I would stick with the cuts that are less expensive. I do like to have these on hand though in a pinch and I can get them from my sister's farm. She raises chicken and so when I go out to my parents, I just purchase a whole bunch from her. I like having them on hand for the reasons that I mentioned. I like ground beef, ground pork, ground moose. It thaws out very fast and so again, Whenever I'm not perfectly prepared with a thought out roast or a thought out whole chicken, I like to use these boneless breasts and I need more ways to make them delicious. And this one really fit the bill. This was loved by all in the family. It is a butter chicken, so sort of an Indian dish by combining cumin, chili powder, garlic powder, garam masala, paprika, turmeric, ginger, salt, and some fresh garlic. I combine all those spices and cook them in the butter on the saute function. After that, I'm adding in a can of tomatoes. Now I looked up a few recipes for this online and all of them call for, or uh, the ones I looked at called for tomato sauce. So I'm just gonna blend up my tomatoes because all I have was diced tomatoes. Either way would totally work, but I like the idea of it being more of a sauce and not chunky. I knew my kids would like it better that way. And so I just blew up and added in some of those chicken breasts. Now this only really needs to cook for like eight minutes at high pressure, but we have a few errands to run this morning. Actually, my oldest is getting her permit. So now we're gonna have a driver on the road, which is nuts. While we're gone, I'm going to get some flatbread dough going. This will serve as sort of a naan for this Indian dish. The exact recipe is over on the blog, farmhousehomboon.com. Essentially, it is fed sourdough starter, so starter that has been fed in the morning and is now bubbly and active, flour, milk, and salt. Now, ideally, you would let that sit all day, ferment it, maybe have this for dinner or do it the night before to have it for lunch the next day. I only was able to let mine ferment for a couple of hours while we were gone. It'll still make a really beautiful flatbread, but if you're doing sourdough for the health benefits, of course, this has not been fermented very long, but it is nice knowing that you can pull something out really easy like this, even if it's not perfectly healthy or perfectly fermented and traditionally prepared, it does have nice clean ingredients like local milk, uh, organic all-purpose flour, which is what I like to use sourdough starter, salt, you know, basic things, nothing with stabilizers. It's, you know, not shelf stable. It's just something that you can make really quick. I like having this kind of option on deck for quick things like this, or even just a side really to any meal, but it's especially tasty with this one. I took the lid off the instant pot, put it back on the saute function and added some cream. And while I was preparing the flatbreads, I let that cook on the saute function to evaporate and thicken with the lid off serving it with some cilantro and rice, and that's a really delicious meal that everybody loved. I have some starter that I was trying to get to rise really fast because I didn't have any bubbly starter before I wanted to make this next thing. So I put it in the center of my stove and I let it rise over. Now, if you stir it down, you'll see that there's a bunch of gas and bubbles and air and yeast and bacteria that make it bubble up like that, and it really will reduce by half the volume if you stir it first. So that's what I did there just to get it back down to a manageable amount. 
I am making my baguette recipe. My sister and I, with our families, have a second annual, I guess we'll call it a tradition at this point, even though it's only the second annual, of doing a shrimp boil on New Year's Eve over at her house. So I am bringing potatoes and shrimp. She is doing the sausage and corn. And then I also want to bring some baguettes to serve alongside. So it'll be all of that good stuff in the boil, the shrimp boil seasoning in a big pot. The kids love it. We just pour it out all over the table. But then I also am going to have this bread on the side. So I mix up my baguette dough, which again, the recipe is over on farmhousehomeboon.com. It's just flour, water, salt, and starter. It's a very hydrated dough. A lot more water per flour ratio, or maybe not a lot, but it's definitely a wetter dough than my usual bread that I make on here, which means that if you allow the gluten to develop properly, it's easy to handle, but if you don't, it can be a little bit tricky. Maybe not the most beginner recipe, but it is pretty simple once you're used to working with sourdough. I have been lately putting my doughs to rise in the pantry. In the winter, it's a little bit cool in there, so they can sit there for almost 24 hours without over-fermenting and be beautiful and bubbly in the morning. Now, normally I would shape this before bed, get it into a plastic bag and in the fridge overnight. I let it ferment overnight, and then I shaped it in the morning, let it rise at room temperature for an hour or two, then put it in the fridge to chill and complete rising before baking. I like to bake it cool. It just scores a lot easier, browns a lot easier, but isn't 100% necessary in a pinch. Since I am using my baguette pan, I do use a trash bag to cover these in the fridge. It's the only thing that they'll fit in with the baguette pan. After I chill them in the fridge, I score them and bake them in a very hot oven with additional steam, which I just create by adding boiling water to a preheated cast iron skillet. I also put the baguette pan on a preheated heated pizza stone. This makes them have that beautiful oven spring and golden color. It'll be so delicious tonight with our New Year's shrimp boil. I hope that you had a wonderful new year and I will see you in my next video. If you're brand new here, please hit that subscribe. I make a new video every week here in our farmhouse. Mm -hmm.